Joy in the city. Joy in your life. Joy in your family. And joy everywhere in Jesus' name. GCK Authority has announced the next level move. From the land of honor and integrity comes two in one GCK live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria, the Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Professionals, titled Recharge to Excel, December 27, 2022, at 0600 hours GMT, all broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms with Jonathan White, our guest music minister. GCK, the gospel to every creature. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your grace and love. Thank you for being with us tonight. And we believe already that the Holy Spirit will shine on the word of God. So that what we need to see, we shall see. What we need to know, we shall know. And you help us to rise up and be able to do the things you want us to do. In the strength you will supply to us in Jesus' name. Shine through the scriptures. Teach us in your word. Instruct us in the word of the living God. So that our lives will be made conformable to your perfect will as revealed in your word. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We're continuing with the study of the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Colossians. And we're looking at chapter 1 today, verse 9. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Already we've gone through the introduction to the epistle. And we've seen that Paul the Apostle affirmed and confirmed that he is chosen to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, not by the will of man, whether himself or any other man, but by the will of God. He spoke about Timothy, a companion in the faith and in the missionary journeys. He said he was writing to the Colossian believers, these people that had become saints and faithful brethren in Christ. He told them and wished and desired that grace will abound unto them. And the peace which they are not received, which they are now received in Christ, will continue with them. Last week we saw that he concentrated on the fruit of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with them. In verse 5, the latter part of verse 5, he talks about the word of the truth of the gospel. And he tells us that these people had received the gospel by faith. He said that gospel had resulted in love in the Colossian Christians. He also tells us that they were resting in the hope of that gospel. In verse 6, it tells us that that gospel had reached them, and it's not only reaching them, it is reaching the world. It tells us that this gospel had borne fruit in their lives. It is reproducing fruit in the lives of the Colossians and in the life of anyone that will receive the gospel today. And it tells us that it is rooted in the grace of God, the God of truth. It's rooted in the grace of God in truth. And he told us and he told them, that that gospel had been reported by men, reported by people like Epaphras. Now, he has given us a broad outline of the reason why he was giving thanks on their behalf. Today, he prays for them. And as he prays for them, we need to learn a lot from what Paul the Apostle did as he prayed. Well, he prayed for a lot of the churches. If you read the opening verses of Romans, you'll see he prayed. If you will read the opening verses of the Corinthians, you will see he prayed for them. By the time you get into the middle of the Galatian epistle, you see he said, I'm traveling in birth for you until Christ be formed in you again. Reading the epistle to the, to the Ephesians, again we see that he prayed for the Ephesian Christians and he didn't fail to pray 
for the Christians at Philippi. Here we come to the Colossian believers. He been praying for them. Writing to Timothy. He reminded Timothy that he had laid hands on him, ministered on him, and because of the gifts that were transpiring to him, through the ministers or through the presbytery, also through his prayer, he should still wake up and manifest the gift or the love of a sound mind. He should manifest the spirit of love and of a sound mind. And in all the epistles you will see, Paul the Apostle is filled with prayer of intercession for believers all around and beyond him. But the prayer we read today is different from the ones he prayed for those other people. There's something we need to notice there that Paul the Apostle himself had never been to Colossae. Therefore, he didn't have any physical contact with them. And yet, he had been praying for them. Before now, he took up his pen and he wrote to them, preaching to them and teaching them. What we learn there is this. You may not have the privilege of preaching to somebody. You can pray for him. You may not have the privilege of teaching house fellowship. You can pray for the people there. You may be denied the privilege of preaching to some people around you or beyond you. But you can pray for them. The purpose of ministry for the apostle, for the prophet, for the evangelist, for the teacher and for the pastor is that we will perfect the saints. And how do we perfect the saints? By the preaching of the word and by the prayer of intercession for the people. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. In what way do we perfect the saints? Preaching and praying. In what way do we encourage the saints of God to continue in the work of the Lord? By preaching and praying. And in what way do we edify and build up and charge the body of Christ, members of the church of the living God, by preaching and praying? And there's something that we need to take note here. Many people, they will say, I don't have anything to do for the Lord because they deny me the opportunity of preaching. Well, you can pray. And prayer is not just something we relegate to the background. When you remember that Abraham prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah. He couldn't preach to them. He didn't have the privilege of preaching to them, but he prayed for them. I still remember that uh, Abraham prayed for the family of that king of Gerar. He couldn't preach the word until he was so afraid, and that man even took his wife. But eventually the Lord appeared to that man in a dream, and eventually Abraham prayed for him and for the family. You remember Job? Everything he said, they contradicted all those his friends. When he spoke about God, when he spoke about his experience in God, when he spoke about the truth of righteousness in God, when he spoke about his experience, they contradicted him. But you see, eventually he prayed for them. You remember David? He prayed for people too. Remember Daniel? When he could not preach to the people, living in exile. You know what he did? He prayed for the people. You remember Elijah? He prayed for the people. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the people had rejected him. They rejected him. They rejected his message. They nailed him to the cross of Calvary. You know what he did? He prayed for them. And when his own disciples were too fearful and too sorrowful to hear what he had to tell them, he prayed for them that God should not take them out of the world but keep them from the evil in the world. And here Paul the Apostle didn't have the physical contact with the Colossian Christians, but even though he wasn't there to preach to them, he prayed for them. There are times that people will complain, and they will say, there is nothing for them to do in the house of God. You can pray for people. Other people will say, and they have denied them of the privilege. Maybe they are under discipline, or they have one problem or the other that is hindering them from preaching the gospel in public, like I am doing now. And they say, there's nothing I can do. I have to fold my hand and sit at the back bench. But you can pray. Paul the Apostle prayed for the people. And what we're learning is that we should commit ourselves to the ministry of the word and to the ministry of praying. He prayed before he wrote. 
He prayed while writing. He prayed after he had written to the people. What a lesson and challenge for us. Before you preach to people, pray. While you are preaching to the people, pray. After preaching to the people, continue to pray for them. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, and in verse 4, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you? A servant of Christ saluteth you. Always laboring fervently for you in prayer, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now, as we look at this verse of scripture which we are studying today, which is Colossians chapter 1 verse 9, we look at three definite points there. Point 1, petition for faithful brethren. Point 2, knowledge of the will of God. Point 3, spiritual wisdom and understanding. Point 1, petition for faithful brethren. Let us look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Here he prayed, but who are the people he was praying for? It's very important. Many of the times, we often pray, but then our intercessory prayers are concentrated on troubled people, sick people, weak people, immature people, backsliding people. We seldom pray for the people who are strong and faithful because all our petition is centered on those who are spiritually weak or physically sick. But here Paul the Apostle was praying for people who are strong in the Lord, praying for people who are faithful brethren, before I go on with these Colossian believers for whom Paul prayed, let us look at the kinds of people we should be praying for, all categories of people. Let's look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. My little children, of whom I travel in birth again until Christ be formed in you. These people had received the gospel earlier. They had been born again. They had become children of God. But confusion came into their midst. Because they were Judaizers, teachers of circumcision, telling them that they could not be saved except they kept the law of Moses, the law that had been abolished when Christ died on the cross of Calvary. And these people were being so confused. And Paul the Apostle said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He said the people that were troubling them, they were seeking to pervert the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he didn't ridicule them. He didn't make fun of them. He didn't criticize them. He corrected them and he prayed for them. You see people who are shaky in their faith. You see people who are being confused. You see people who are giving up the foundation of their faith, what do you do for them? You pray for them. You travail in birth for them again until Christ be formed in them. Acts of the Apostles chapter 12, verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Peter had been arrested and imprisoned because of preaching the gospel because of standing for the truth and then we are told here that the church prayed for him we should pray for those who are suffering persecution for those who might perhaps have been in captivity because of that persecution and we cannot reach them our prayers will reach them they couldn't go to the prison there to encourage him to exhort him to preach to him but they could pray for him. You may not be able to reach some people to pray for them, to encourage them, to exhort them, pray for them. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, 
I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. You cannot preach to all men. They speak different language than the one you speak. You cannot preach to all men. Many people are far away removed from you. You cannot preach to all men. Some of them are illiterate, and you cannot speak their language. You cannot preach to all men. Some of them are so sophisticated and highly placed that you will not sound logical enough to be able to preach to them. You will not be able to preach to all men because some of them will even reject what you are saying, but you can pray for all men. You can take those groups of people one by one. You do not wait until you say, I pray to so and so, I pray to such and such. You may not be able to reach them with your preaching. You reach them with your prayer, but still, for kings. You may not be able to preach to kings. You may not be able to reach the president of this country and, all, and other countries in Africa and preach directly to them, but you can pray for them. And then it says, for all that are in authority, you may not be able to reach all the commissioners and the governors and the ministers of this ministry and that ministry, but you can pray for them. What if you will have an opportunity to meet with the president of the country or the governor in your state and be able to preach for one hour? Well, you say, I'll be glad. Well, the opportunity doesn't always come. But there's one kind of opportunity that is always there. You can take one hour of your time and pray for them. Because the word of God says, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. The fault we have as members of the church is that if we cannot preach to a group of people, then we don't do anything for them. If we cannot preach to a set of religious people who reject our a message because of their religion, then we do not have any ministry for them. But you know what we can do? When you are not able to preach to them, pray for them. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You are just leading us fellowship. And you say, I wish I could also touch the other's fellowship over there and be able to preach to them. You may not be able to they have their own house fellowship leader. But you know what you can do? You can pray and make supplication for all saints. In your own house fellowship and the other house fellowship. You see other people in other churches and you say, come to our church. We teach the word of God. And we lay it line upon line, precept upon precept. They may not all agree with you. They would want to stay in their church. You may not be able to reach them with your invitation and your preaching. You know what you can do? You can reach them with your prayer. Supplication and prayers for all saints. Verse 19, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Oh, you say, sometimes I think I even know what I want to say uh, to encourage and to exhort and to preach to the pastor and to preach to the apostle and to preach to the evangelist, but they will not allow me. They only give cards to those who are, who are looking for counseling, but I'm not looking for counseling. I, I think I know what I ought to do, and I think I'm all right in my life, and I think I have a word of exhortation for the pastor, but they will not help me, they will not allow me to reach the pastor with my preaching and with my exhortation. Well, you can pray for him. And Paul the Apostle said, and pray for me, that utterance may be given unto me and that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. What we're learning from what Paul the Apostle did to the Colossians is that we can pray for the people we may not be able to reach with our message. Or with our preaching, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. You know, this kind of people, the children of Israel, they rejected Paul's message completely. 
They said they didn't want anything that will take the law of Moses and circumcision and the whole system of Judaism away from their hands. And when Paul tried to preach to them, they rejected the preaching. But then he said, I'm praying for them. And they will not be able to reject my prayer. He said in verse 3, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You know, there are religious people, and they will be going about to establish their own righteousness. They will say, once I do this and this and this and this and that, I'll qualify myself to get to heaven or to go into the presence of God by what I can do for myself in my religion. And you may not be able to reach them with the gospel, with the preaching. You know what you can do? You can pray for them. Paul the Apostle was far removed from these people, and yet he prayed for them. But let's look at another thing. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Who are these people Paul referred to as you? They were faithful brethren in Christ. They were saints in Christ. Let me just show you the character and the nature of their lives. Look at it from verse 2, chapter 1. To the saints. I told you before that the grace of God had reached these people. The mighty hand of God had touched them. And that God had broken them down, convicted them of their sins, had touched them and cleansed them, and they had become clean and holy and righteous. They were saints of God. Not only that, too. They were brethren. Not only that they were brethren, they were faithful brethren. You know, faithful people, faithful to God, faithful to Christ, faithful to the teaching of the Word of God, and faithful to the promises they are making to one another. Not only that, grace be multiplied, grace be unto you. They are the grace of God that brought salvation, teaching them to, uh, to deny all ungodliness and worldly laws. These people were living righteously by the grace of God. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I told you earlier that these people had the peace of God. Now think about it. You don't pray for such people. But Paul prayed for them. You see a coordinator, you see a zona leader, always strong, the child of God faithful, working for God, never getting sick, never discouraged, always preaching, always praying, always doing one kind of work for the Lord somewhere. You always find him in church. You always find him in the district. You say, that man doesn't need prayer. He is strong. You know what Paul did? He knew these people were strong. He knew these people were faithful. He knew they had the grace of God. He knew they had the peace of God. He prayed for them. And you know, it said about these people in verse 4, it said, we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Have you known people like that? They are among the prayer warriors. They already have faith. And they can pray heaven down. They believe in God. And it said, your love to all the saints. The people were so loving. They had faith on the one hand. They had uh, love on the other hand. And they had hope that is laid up for them in heaven. Those three things that are very, very important. Now there abided faith and charity and hope. And it says of these three, the greatest is charity. And these people are these greatest things that you can talk about. They had faith. They had love. They had hope. And Paul still prayed for them. We don't pray for such people. Oh, we say that man has faith. That man has love. He has the love of God. He loves God with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind, all his strength. And he's always joyful. He's always smiling. He's always happy. He doesn't have any problem. He talks about the hope of going to heaven as if he's gone to the third heaven and come back. He doesn't need any prayer. What a great mistake we are praying. Paul the Apostle knew that these people were faithful. He knew that these people were loving. He knew that these people had hope in the Lord. And he prayed for them. He said in verse 6, and he said, it bringeth forth fruit. These people were very fruitful. Talk about fruitful in evangelism. Talk about being fruitful in the, in the fruit of the Spirit. Talk about being fruitful in anything they lay their hands upon. Paul the Apostle said, looking at the outworking of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, 
you are fruitful. You are bringing forth fruit and you are increasing in that fruit. And yet, he prayed for them. They were rooted in the grace of God. Abiding grace. Abundant grace. The grace that makes them to reign in life. They were rooted in the grace of God. And yet, Paul the apostle prayed for them. And in verse 8, they had the Holy Ghost that shared the love of God abroad in their hearts. And yet, he was praying for them. What we're learning is this. When you see people who are strong, don't leave them alone and say, they are strong, they don't need my prayer. They need your prayer. When you see people that are full of faith, don't say, that man is full of faith. He can pray for himself. We need your prayer. When you see people that have hope in Christ and a hope of heaven laid up for him in heaven, and you say, that man is always joyful in hope. We need to pray for them. You know what Paul the Apostle did? He prayed for the faithful brethren. You pray for the weak. You pray for the immature. You pray for the backsliders. You pray for the sinners. You pray for kings and those in authority. You pray for all people. You pray for those who are faithful, those who are steady, those who have faith in the Lord. Those who are strong in the Lord as well. Let's see what Jesus did in John chapter 17. Reading from verse 6. John 17 verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. And they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given them the words which thou givest me, and they have received them. And I have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. You see what Jesus did here? The people had received the word of the gospel that Jesus preached. They never rejected any part of the word. And Jesus said, I pray for them. You see people who are receiving the word of God, you have a convert. And that word of that convert is taking in the word of God as the sponge is taking in water. And you say, that man is so soaked with the word of God, is receiving the word of God, is accepting the truth of the word of God. I think now I can pray for other people. He doesn't need prayer. Jesus prayed for the people that received the word. And if that convert is soaking in the word of God, a sponge is soaking in water. You know what you need to do? You pray for him too. Verse 14. I have given them thy word. And the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. But that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. You see somebody who by the grace of God has renewed his heart. And it's not conformed to the things or the system of the world. You see somebody by the grace of God who has received the pure religion and undefiled before God, keeping himself unspotted from the world. You see somebody who has taken the warning of the word of God that says ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. If therefore you will be a friend of the world, you will be the enemy of God. And this fellow has uh, gotten rid of everything of worldliness in her life or in his life. And you say, oh, she doesn't need prayer. In her life, in her lifestyle, in her dressing, everything she does, she has shown very clearly she is not of the world. But Jesus said, these people are not of the world, and yet he prayed for them. Verse 17, sanctify them. Through thy truth, thy word is true. Verse 20, neither pray for this alone. But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. He prayed for them even though they were not of the world. What should we be doing? We should be praying for the people that are strong in the Lord. People that are faithful in the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 1, from verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love to all the saints. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. These people had faith. These people had love. And Paul the Apostle knew that even though they had faith, even though they had love, 
They have not got everything that heaven could offer. We pray for them that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. In Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1 from verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel. From the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. These people had the good foundation laid in their lives, laid in their hearts. And Paul the Apostle said, a good work has been started in you. And yet, he continued to pray for them. The lesson we're receiving here tonight is that we should not only be praying for those who are sick, we should be praying for those who are well. We should not only be praying for those who are weak, we should be praying for those who are strong. We should not only be praying for those who seem inconsistent, we should be praying for those who are faithful. We should not only be praying for those who are young and immature, we should be praying for those who are getting older in the faith and are strong and firm in the faith. We should not only be praying for backsliders, we should be praying for people who remain saints and faithful brethren in the Lord. Philippians chapter 1 verse 8, For God is my record. How greatly I long after you in all the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in the knowledge, in knowledge and all judgment. So then, if we are learning anything from these passages, we're learning this, that we ought to pray for all people, the weak and the strong, the inconsistent and the consistent, the unfaithful and the faithful, the young and the old, the immature, and immature. Almost everyone believes in prayer. Almost everyone will say, oh, yes, I believe. I believe in prayer. But very few people believe in praying without ceasing. We must be conscious of the urgency of prayer. And we must develop the habit of praying. Make prayer a way of life. That means when you really believe in praying, praying without ceasing, your prayer will not be sporadic, it will be regular. Your prayer will not be occasional, it will be continual. And your prayer will not be egocentric, only praying for yourself. Your prayer will be Christ-centered. Your prayer will not be grasping, give me this, give me that. Your prayer will be intercessory. How we need to join with the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, teach us to pray. Let's look at point two. As we look at point two, we're looking at the knowledge of God's will. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. That ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Paul the Apostle knew something. You can only be as strong as the knowledge of the Word of God you have. You cannot be any stronger. If your Christian life does not have knowledge, your Christian maturity will not have backbone. You'll be shaky. You'll be flexible. If you do not have the knowledge of the will and the Word of God, you will not be strong. You will be all flesh without bone. And you will not be able to stand. And you will not be able to do the thing that God wants you to do. And therefore Paul the Apostle knew the importance of knowledge. What does the Bible say? Doesn't the Bible say, my people perish for lack of knowledge? And the honorable men are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. If we are going to be strong in the Lord, we're going to have, we, we ought to have the knowledge of the will of God. Turn with me to John chapter 7, verses 16 and 17. John chapter 7, verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, and 
but he is that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. What the Lord is telling us here is that the key to having the knowledge of the teaching and the doctrine and the will of God is the willingness to obey. You see, God carries out inspection every time. You come to the Lord and you say, I want to understand the word of God. I want to go deep in the knowledge of the word of God. And God is going to examine your heart. If I show you my will, are you going to be willing to do my will? If that willingness is there, then it will give you the knowledge. If you really desire to do the will of God, then it will make you to know the doctrine and the teaching of the word of God. Hosea tells us in chapter 6, verse 3, Then shall we know if we follow on to know. You see the use of the word know there? Then shall we know if we follow on to know. If you only come once, you won't know enough. If you only read the Bible casually, you will not know enough. If you only browse through many chapters of the Bible, you will not know the truth. We shall know if we follow on to know the Lord. is going forth, is prepared as the morning, and it shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. Therefore, if we really want to have the knowledge of the truth, you know what we need to do? We need to make sure that we follow on to know. That means you have the attitude and the, and the uh, thirst within you. You say, Lord, I know this, but I don't know enough yet. I know that, but I don't know enough yet. You are willing to follow on to know. In Second Peter chapter 1, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. That's the man that is really seeking and searching. And he really wants to know the will of God, the mind of God, the knowledge of the will of God. Because he's following on to know that way, the Lord will give him the knowledge that he seeks after. Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. From verse 3, yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and lifted up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hidden treasure, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and shalt find the knowledge of God. You see how those businessmen look for money and search for money? You see how those workers look and search and try to get themselves prepared for promotion and for prosperity. You see how those professional people will try to read every journal. And they will try to seek for knowledge to make themselves better in their chosen profession. And then they are able to get knowledge of the things of this world. And the Lord says, you are going to have the same desire, the same thirst, the same aspiration, the same intent. And you are seeking for the truth of the word of God as a merchant is seeking for silver. As a professional man is seeking and trying to find out some things in the journals. It says they will cry after knowledge. And you lift up your voice towards understanding. And you are seeking for that knowledge of the will of God as silver, as hidden treasure. And then will the Lord reveal to you the knowledge of his will. And so we learn that this is what we need. You see? If we do not have the knowledge, our lives will not be straightforward. If we do not have the knowledge of the things of God, what will happen is that we'll be living defeated lives. Let us look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. Some have not the knowledge of God. If you want to live a righteous life, a steady life, a life that is firm in the truth, you know what you need? The knowledge of God. The knowledge of the word and the will of God. Let's go back to Colossians. I want to show you something there. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. You know what Paul the Apostle was praying for? 
He wasn't just praying that these people will know the will of God. He was praying for them that they will be filled with the knowledge of his will. I want you to take your Bible and mark that word filled in your Bible. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. Now as you read it in the English Bible, it may not strike you that that word is very important. And that word is very strategic. When Paul the Apostle said, my prayer for you is this, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, it's using a very descriptive word, a very important word, a word that is very deep with meaning. Let me show you what it means. When you fill a bucket with water, and uh, somebody says, you know, take this uh, cup of water, and uh, where do I put it? Pour it into that bucket. Oh, you say that bucket is full of water already. It cannot take any other thing. You know what you are saying? You are saying when something is full, it means that it is so full to the absence of everything else. You cannot put anything there again because it is filled. You are trying to arrange something in the portmanteau. And somebody says, hey, can you put this into that portmanteau? Oh, you say the whole thing is filled up. And it will not take any other thing. It is so full that you cannot bring anything there again anymore. But that's the physical, material sense. Let me now show you the spiritual sense. When it says you are filled, look at um, Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs 14, verse 14. The backslider in heart shall be filled, that's the word, filled with his own ways. You know what that means? The man is so full of self that no idea will come in. He is so motivated and regulated by what he thinks by what he feels, by his own supposition, by his own ideology, that no other thing will come in. And you know how he behaves? He behaves under the control and the domination and the power of his own self-will because his backslider in heart is filled with his own way. When somebody is filled with something, it's under the total control of that thing. That's what the New Testament tells us. Look at this in Luke chapter 6. And verse 11. Luke 6, 11. And they were filled with madness. And they communed one with another. What they might do to Jesus. These people were angry. They were mad. They were furious. And they were so filled with anger. That there was no kind of love. There was no sentiment. There was no gentleness. There was no meekness or humility within them. They were completely under the control and the dominating force and power of that anger. They were filled with anger. Let us look at this in John chapter 16, verse 6. John 16, verse 6. For because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. Jesus revealed to his own disciples, he said, I'll be going. And the way I will go, I'll be taken by wicked hands and I'll be killed and you will not see me anymore. And when he told them that, there was no joy at all. They sat down. Their sitting was controlled by sorrow. The expression of their face was made up because of the sorrow in their heart. The voice, the trembling on their voice was dictated by the sorrow in their heart. They were under the total control and the dominating force of sorrow because sorrow had filled their heart. Let me show you in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, now in verse 7 and verse 8. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, verse 9, if this day we be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught by you builders, 
which is become the head of the corner, neither is there any salva salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Who is talking? It's our old friend, Peter. Many days, some months before this time, somebody confronted him and said, you are one of the disciples of Jesus Christ. You know him. And that man was so fearful. Fear controlled his heart. And he said, I don't know him. I don't know what you are saying. And he began to swear. This same Peter now had been reclaimed by the Lord, restored by the Lord. And now, after the day of Pentecost, and the Lord had even walked through him, and this important man had risen up. Then the people came and they laid hands on him and John. They imprisoned him. Then they brought him out before the council. And this was normally a naturally fearful, timid man who would have denied, who would have been saying, I hope they don't kill us. I hope they don't do this. But they questioned him. They said, by what name? By what authority have you done this? And just before he opened his mouth, the Spirit of God filled him. What does that mean? That means that no fear was in the heart now. Boldness, authority, anointing, and power filled him. You see, when the heart is filled with something, that thing will be under the total control and the total dominating force and power of what is filling you. And was so filled with the Holy Ghost, he opened his mouth and he spoke to those people and he told them there's no salvation in any other when those people saw the boldness and the fearlessness within them, they knew they had been with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now come to Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. And let us know what it means to be filled with the knowledge of his will. For this cause we also, since the day we had it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. You know what he meant? What he meant is this that you will have the knowledge of the will of God, that there will be no self-will in you anymore. Because when you are full of the knowledge of his will, then you don't have any place for the will of self, for the will of mommy and daddy, for the will of society, for the will of advisors and exhorters, for the will of all the people around you, because... You are so filled with the knowledge of the will of God. Everything you do, every step you take, will be under the control and the dominating power of the knowledge of the will of God. You know the will of God so much, and you are so filled with the will of God so much that nothing else controls you. Anything you want to do, and people say, will you do this? I want to know the will of God. I'm going to do the will of God. You know, some people, when they pray, they do not pray, thy will be done. You know how they pray? Thy will be changed. They look at their lives, and they say, God, and they do not even know whether God wants them to be in that condition, whether God has a purpose in that condition. They just go to God and say, God, remove this sin. Remove this sin. Change your will. Don't pray like that. Pray, Lord, thy will be done. Be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. Now, as we talk about the will of God, what's the will of God? Because we ought to know what the will of God is. If you know the centrality of the will of God as revealed in the scripture, any other thing you are trying to decide to be the will of God, you'll be able to point to the model and a pattern and a foundation of the will of God. What is the will of God for you? First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the will of God. God's will for you is that you should be saved. Now, think about this. Somebody comes to you and he says, that church you are going to, they preach too much Bible. Every time they are talking about salvation, every time they are talking about being born again, every time restitution, every time righteousness, Come to this other church. And I think that will be the will of God for you. Then you say, can that be the will of God? What's the will of God for me? The will of God for me is that I should be saved. And that I should remain in the salvation of the Lord. And I can see 
that from what I'm hearing here, it will help me to be saved and to remain saved. Staying here then will be the will of God. So how do you determine the will of God in your life? The will of God is that you are saved. And any other thing in your life that contradicts that salvation experience of God in your life, that's no more the will of God. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. You see the will of God here? Purity of heart, holiness of life. That is the will of God. Let me bring this illustration to you. Maybe you are 26, 27 years of age as a lady. And you are developed just like any other woman. In fact, people will think, if you didn't tell them, people will think that you are married already because you look like a married woman. What I'm saying is that you are developed enough, matured enough physically, and then uh, you are looking for accommodation. And uh, somebody says, we are distant relation, and uh, he is a man. And he says, well, I have one room. If you don't mind, uh, you can bring your mat or your mattress and spread it there, and, uh, you know, you can, you can sleep there. I'll be on the bed and you'll be on the ground in the same room. And uh, if you do that, if you're looking for accommodation you have not found, you can come and share with me. He is a man. He's not married. You are a woman. You are not married. And this fellow said, because you have been looking for accommodation a long time, here is an offer. And then somebody said, pray about it. It may be the will of God. What's the will of God? This is the will of God, even your sanctification, your purity, and your holiness. If you do that, will you remain holy? If you do that, will you remain pure? The answer is no. That thing cannot be the will of God. Anything that contradicts sanctification, holiness, and purity in your life, that thing cannot be the will of God. Here you are. And you're looking for accommodation. As I said, maybe you're 26, 27 years of age, and you're a matured woman. And the family says, oh, you can come over here. And uh, you can be living with the family. I'm married. You see my wife is there. Therefore, you can live here. And uh, whichever part you have in the, in the house, you share with us. And uh, you look at the place and say, okay, maybe I will try. And you discover that the man is becoming more familiar to you, more familiar with you than familiar with his wife. Now you know this thing is contradicting holiness and sanctification in your life. Is it the will of God to remain in that place? No, it cannot be. You know the will of God? This is the will of God. Even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Friends, brothers and sisters, that is how we determine the will of God. Some people do not know that if something contradicts holiness, that cannot be the will of God. Let us look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 15. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Sometimes it happens that people are telling lies against you. Oh, they say that man is a cheat. They say that man is a liar. They say that man is not a faithful fellow. And somebody will tell you and say, oh, you, you are a righteous fellow, and you are a serious fellow, a disciplined fellow, and people are suspecting you that you are not you know, as faithful as you really are. Why don't you do what they are saying? And become unfaithful and teach them a lesson. And maybe the devil is tempting you and saying, well, since they say I'm not a good fellow, since they say I'm not faithful, I'm not righteous, let me prove it to them. Don't do that. You know the will of God? It is the will of God that with well-doing you will put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. First Peter chapter 4, verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Let them that suffer according to the will of God Maybe you are married and your husband is hard. That man is hard. And uh, you've been facing real persecution and you are a Christian. You have been following the Lord. And somebody comes to you and he says, this persecution you are facing, are you just going to continue suffering like this? Pack out of the house of the man. 
and uh, leave him alone, let the rascal go and be cooking for himself and doing everything for himself. He does not appreciate you. Therefore, pack out. And because you are suffering too much. And fight the battle yourself. And get your own people. Get your own mother and father. Don't you have relatives? Get them to fight the man for you. If you are a Christian, you cannot fight. Get people who can fight for you. Is that the will of God? Verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. Don't do evil. You commit yourself, your soul, to the Lord, and you keep on doing well. As you have committed yourself unto a faithful creator. Oh, they say, you are a member of that church, and the church doesn't see you, and the pastor doesn't see you. He doesn't have heart for you. He doesn't have any kind of love for you. And you are there, you are just rot away. And you are suffering. Because when you are there, you are not able to do this and express yourself and do whatever you like. Isn't that suffering? And somebody is saying, fight back, criticize the church, criticize everybody, knock everybody down. Let them know you are not going to take this suffering from anybody. After all, you can do it. Can't you do it? Is that the will of God? Look at it. Wherefore? Let him that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. You never do evil. There is no justification, no matter what people do to you. No matter what the church does to you. No matter what the brothers and sisters do to you. No matter what the people at the place of work, no matter what they do to you. There is never any justification for ceasing, for stopping to do well. You commit the keeping of your soul to the Lord in well-doing. Look at 1 Thessalonians. This is the will of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're looking for the will of God. Here is the will of God. Chapter 5 verse 18. In everything, giving, give thanks. You're suffering. In everything, give thanks. Or see that you are being persecuted. In everything, give thanks. People are neglecting you and belittling you. In everything, give thanks. There's no justification to grumble. No justification to condemn other people. No justification to criticize. No justification to oppose the church and the people of God. Whatever people do against you, you say, I'm suffering wrongfully, give thanks. You say, they are belittling me and just making me to sit down there and I know I'm better than this. In everything, give thanks. You say, that husband is not giving me my right, doesn't respect me and I'm, I'm worth more than this. Before, before I married this man, I know what I could be by myself. In everything, give thanks. In this place of work, I know how to be promoted. I know how to have got this and got that. What have those other people done who have got promotion, which I have not done in everything? You know what to do? Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's never the will of God for you to fight. It's never the will of God for you to condemn other people. It's never the will of God for you to manifest your self-will and say, I will do it this way, I will do it that way. Never the will of God for us to stop doing well. In everything you will give thanks because that's the will of God for you. Did you see in the Bible reading we read today, Paul the Apostle, after he went out and he preached the gospel, and he denied himself, and the Lord showed him revelation and said, come over to Macedonia and help us. On the basis of that revelation and the will of God, he went to this place to Philippi. And when he got there, he started preaching. And people were going to the seashore. And he denied himself of all conveniences and went over there and was preaching and preaching. And these themselves with the, uh, with the soothsaying spirit followed after him and said, These are the people of God who show unto us the way of salvation. And Paul was gentle. He didn't cast out that spirit even the first day. He wasn't aggressive. He wasn't going to fight for himself. But all of a sudden, one day, as this lady was doing it every day, every day, the Spirit of God spurred him up and he challenged that evil spirit and said, come out of her. And it came out and they laid hands on him. 
adult man, they removed his clothes, they beat him mercilessly. After that, they threw him, not that they led him gently, they threw him into the prison and they made stalks on his feet. You know what he did at midnight? Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto the Lord. That's the will of God. Never the will of God to regret why am I a Christian. That's not the will of God. Never the will of God to back out and say the suffering is too much. I cannot take it anymore. You know the will of God? In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And so Paul the apostle prayed for the Colossian Christians. Look at Colossians chapter 1. And in verse 9, he prayed for them that they will be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. And that's the kind of prayer we need to pray. That you and I will be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. That leads us to point 3. Also that they will be filled in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. When we talk about wisdom, wisdom is the ability to take the principles revealed in the word of God and apply those principles to life situations. We are commanded that we ought to pray that God will give us the needed wisdom so that we'll be able to live and serve God to the glory of his name. But there are some kinds of people that have a kind of wisdom which is not from God. Let us look at um, James chapter 3 from verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye are bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Somebody says, I'm an apprentice in my place of work under my master. And he tells me to sell those spare parts and I have the wisdom to add this and add this and put the rest of the money in my pocket and that man will never discover it. That wisdom descendeth not from above but is earthly and sensual and devilish. Somebody says, you know, when I see a beautiful lady, no matter who, say, who is, uh, you know, the suitor or the fiancé, uh, the fiancé of that uh, lady, if I talk to that lady, I will catch her, I will get her. I have that inborn wit, uh, wisdom to be able to get any lady I want. You know that kind of wisdom? This wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly and sensual and devilish. Somebody says, if you put a biro or money on the table and you turn your face, I can pick up that thing, I have the wisdom, and you will not be able to tell who took it. You know that kind of wisdom? This wisdom descended not from above. It is earthly, sensual, devilish. If anybody has any quarrel with me, and they call us to say, what happened? No matter who, I can make my case and wind everything in the leg of that man or that woman and just knock him down, no matter who is looking at the case, I have the wisdom to tell my story, even if I cheat that man, even if I cheat that woman, I can tell my story that that man will get into trouble. That kind of wisdom, you know from where it is, this wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly and sensual and devilish. Somebody says, you can lock the door with a padlock. And without any key in my hand, I can just take uh, that padlock and I will not spoil it. I have the wisdom. I can open that thing, enter into that room, take whatever I want to take.